Ever wondered why Disneyland Paris stands out as one of the most well-designed Disney parks? This is Frontierland at the Magic Kingdom. It features Big Thunder, a log flume ride, soon to be Tiana's Bio Adventure, and a few shops and restaurants. Big Thunder is located on the corner and somewhat hidden behind Tom Sawyer's Island, which is only accessible via raft. And this is Disneyland Paris Frontierland. Big Thunder is front and center, located in the middle of the lake. The shops are located on one side side and the restaurants on the other, creating a captivating, breathtaking view and that's just the beginning. Phantom Manor creates another focal point in what would be otherwise a dead end, and this pattern is located throughout the whole park. In each land you see the attention to detail and care that went into everything. Disneyland Paris stands out with incredible design in every land of Park Disneyland. Let's unveil the secrets behind Disneyland Paris exceptional design. One of the most overlooked aspects of theme park design is the entrance. Guests need to come to the park somehow. When Disneyland opened in 1955, it had a simple entrance. It was very utilitarian. You know, you get your tickets, you come in, you wait in a big line. You could see the train station, but it's only after you cross it that you do see the castle. Euro Disneyland was set to have a similar entrance. However, an idea emerged. What if the entrance was also a weenie, attracting guests and creating a new icon for the park. But how could this be done? How could a hotel be practically inside the park, but still be a hotel with all the amenities that guests want, like pool, bar and restaurants? Well, the hotel is divided in three parts. The reception, which is located on the north side, providing road access and also not visible to guests who are entering the park. This allows for hotel guests to have privacy, despite being one of the most crowded areas in the whole continent. The same idea is also mirrored on the other side. The pool is is again hidden. But this hotel is basically inside the park, so wouldn't people want to see the park? And that's where the center comes into play, allowing for incredible views of Main Street. The architecture is Victorian, similar to the Grand Floride, but also features the iconic Mickey Mouse clock, a nod to allow you to know where you're going to. But Disneyland would face a major challenge. Throughout his years as a storyteller, Walt Disney would adapt many classic tales into animation, from Snow White to Cinderella. These were European stories that existed for generations, but now Disneyland was coming to Europe. How could it remain authentically Disney, but adapt to the European market? This was a challenge the Imagineers would face. After years of expansion from building Epcot to MGM Studios, they discovered that great design requires great direction and leadership, and the shape of Disneyland Paris itself was determined by Tony Baxter, Eddie Soto, and Tim Delaney. Let's start with Main Street. Looking at the train station, you immediately notice something different. This doesn't look like a small town train station. With its impressive architecture, it looks like a downtown metro hub, while back in the day, Eddie and his team of Imagineers had a very different idea for Main Street. Instead of being set in the early 1900s, it would be moved to the 20s, an age where Europeans admired America, especially jazz, as America emerged as the dominating world power. As so, electric trains and hidden bars would be present, gasoline vehicles and even gangsters. Unfortunately, these ideas were rejected, but some elements remain. Main Street at Disneyland Paris has a much bigger town vibe. Look at Main Street Motors, for instance, and its big adverts. It doesn't have that small town feel, since Europeans don't have that same nostalgia for towns they never heard of. Main Street gives every building a sense of large scale. I mean, compare the trolley garages. Everything here feels like an expensive movie set, like in Hello Dolly. In fact, both Eddie Soto and Tony Baxter were inspired by the incredible set design in that movie, and Tony was even an extra in that movie. Additionally, Walt Disney Imagineer faced another challenge, the weather snow, rain, and lots of foggy rain. How could they keep the gas dry, but also not ruin the views when the weather is bright? In Tokyo Disneyland, there is a large canopy in World Bazaar, covering the entirety of Main Street, or World Bazaar as it's called, but it has its downsides, mainly the cost. So Imagineers came up with a solution, a system of somewhat hidden walkways that stretch from Main Street all the way to Adventureland and then to Fantasyland to the back of Peter Pan. Main Street 
features these impressive arcades, highlighting what makes this park special. Its attention to detail, every art piece and every little mechanical invention or historical reference look like it belongs in a museum or art gallery. Meanwhile, Imagineers were working on how to adapt Tomorrowland to the European market. The idea would be to not focus on the future as we imagine it, but as envisioned by great visionaries from Da Vinci to Jules Verne and also George Lucas. Discovery Land was born. Tim Delaney would lead a team of Imagineers to design this land. Immediately when you enter this land, you'll notice how different it is from Tomorrowland. The first building used to be Le Visionarium, a 360 degree show. Unlike others from around the world where the shape of the building is hidden, here, the geometry of the circle is front and center, even featuring a dome on top. One of the highlights is the Hyperion, from island at the top of the world. You can also find the Astro Orbiter. Discovery Land was originally supposed to be anchored by an even bigger modern marvel, Discovery Mountain. Unlike Space Mountain, this would not just be a roller coaster, but a full-on pavilion featuring multiple attractions. Unfortunately, after being pushed back to 1995, budget only allowed for that roller coaster to be built at the Nautilus. Nevertheless, Space Mountain in Paris is one of the most impressive versions, with its fantastic exterior and canon, giving the land that kinetic energy. So Tim Delaney had a dream, and he never gave up on it. Discovery Land stands out for its impressive design and storytelling. Back in the day, it even made more sense, but with the introduction of new IP, it has made the land a bit weird with Buzz Lightyear. Discovery Land is like a dream where all of your Jules Verne fantasies become reality. It was all possible thanks to great leadership and focus on the guest experience. But perhaps the masterpiece of Disneyland Paris is well the castle. Disneyland Paris is located close to some impressive destinations and many castles. If you look at Cinderella Castle and Sleeping Beauty Castle at Disneyland, you see the inspiration from great European castles like Neuschwanstein. Now, the challenge came, how would an European Disney castle look? Disney is a world of fantasy and imagination, so Imagineers came up with a fantastical out-of-this-world castle that looks straight out of the frames of Sleeping Beauty. Le Château de la Belle à Bois Dormant. It's not just impressive from afar, but also up close. Take a look at these small square trees and how they look similar to the ones from the movie. The turrets and windows are also detailed to a point where you will need to use your zoom to actually see the small details, like the snails a personal favorite. The incredible design of Le Chateau de la Belle au Bois Dormant was all possible thanks to the incredible work of Tom K. Morris, a great Disney Imagineer. But we also have to address the elephant in the room, or in this case, the dragon. Yes, Disneyland Paris features a dragon inside the castle. This is a great example of storytelling. Fantasyland is equally as detailed. In 1983, Disneyland had remodeled its Fantasyland, removing the old tents that are still present at Walt Disney World's version and making it look like an European village. But Disneyland Paris would look even more impressive. In fact, Fantasyland can be split into different European countries. Peter Pan, Alice and Toad are British. The area near the castle is mostly French. Snow White is German. We also have Italy with the old Fantasia Gelati and Bella Notte. But it's not just the genius geography. Fantasyland is elevated by fantastic landscaping, creating an iconic view basically anywhere. The water flows in a bright blue color. The garden shines with topiaries and flowers. It's like a dream, but real. The detail even goes to the shop's interiors. Fantasyland at Disneyland Paris is a reinvention of a classic. This was possible because Imagineers had a great vision of what they wanted to accomplish and how that fit with the context of European culture. But let's continue this theme of discovery with the next land. 
Adventureland, highlighting one of the great things about Disneyland Paris. Everything is explorable. There are a bunch of hidden details and places to immerse yourself. You can see this with the Aladdin walkthrough, a place where you can escape the crowds. Another example is Adventure Island. Disneyland Paris doesn't have necessarily a Tom Sawyer Island, so this is basically the equivalent, but Imagineers made the wise decision to allow guests to access it easily via bridges. Adventure Island features many spaces to explore, including caverns, but the highlight of Adventureland is Pirates of the Caribbean, which is a far superior version of the Walt Disney World version. Adventureland was also supposed to have a mini Indiana Jones land, but the only thing that became a reality is a budget-friendly roller coaster that is frankly not really that good. The entrance to Adventureland is perfect, focusing on the Middle East. This portal acts as your entrance to this marvelous land, where other things can be found. However, perhaps the centerpiece of Disneyland Paris is Frontierland. If you have ever been to a theme park outside Disneyland Paris in Europe, you will notice something. Almost all have a western area, so Imagineers knew they had to absolutely top everything else. Frontierland at Magic Kingdom doesn't feel like a complete land. Well, that is because something is missing here, Western River Expedition. This was a mega complex featuring many attractions, one of which would be a Wild West version of Pirates of the Caribbean, all housed within this massive structure, Thunder Mesa. Ultimately, this never happened unfortunately. Mark Davis' vision never became a reality. However, the spirit of Thunder Mesa lives on at Disneyland Paris. Frontierland has its entrance themed as a fort, marking a dualism between the settlers and the Native Americans. After this, you are treated by an incredible view of Big Thunder Mount, and the facilities are located on both sides. One side serves as the main retail location, whilst the other serves as food. This allows for both to have more impressive interiors as opposed to Walt Disney World. The restaurants are incredible, featuring detailed interiors, for instance. At the dand end of this road sits an old manor. Imagineers opted for a neat ticket here. Disneyland Paris has no New Orleans Square or Liberty Square, so the natural fit for Haunted Mansion was Frontierland, but this would not just be a simple color switch. Because of the great amount of visitors coming from all over Europe, how would they communicate this is a haunted house without using many translations? Well, they opted to change the name to Phantom Manor and feature our scary exterior. The backstory even connects to Big Thunder Mountain. Phantom Manor from the outside looks like a typical American Victoria house, but what gives away its haunted feel is the use of color. More neutral to dark tones give it a Bates Motel feel, rather than bright yellows or white, typically featured in those houses. Additionally, the brown woods create a sensation as if the paint has chipped off, evoking the sense that this house has been abandoned for a long time. It's details like this that elevate mediocre theme park design, transforming it into greatness. Disneyland Paris is filled with these elements, intricately woven into its design, solidifying its statue as a beacon in theme park design throughout the whole world. But the joy doesn't stop here. Let's go back to Big Thunder. Now, Big Thunder was basically Tony Baxter's baby. Remember that old Thunder Mesa concept? Well, there was supposed to be a runaway mine train roller coaster, which evolved into Big Thunder Mountain. And when planning this new resort, Tony Baxter was going to make this Big Thunder the best one. But how? Well, Big Thunder would be located in the center of Frontierland, creating multiple focal points, what today we call Instagrammable moments. The mountain would also be surrounded by the rivers of the Far West, with the same program as Walt Disney World. Another challenge was how could we get passengers from here to the other side of the lake? Go over? Well, no, because of the riverboat. Well, this is when a challenge becomes fun. Why not go under, creating the best part of the whole ride, elevating theme park design to a new level? Frontierland is not just Big Thunder, there is a whole lot of wilderness here too, featuring one of my favorite parts, the Cowboy Cookout, nice and quiet. Park Disneyland is a masterpiece of theme park design, from the little hidden details to the important creative decisions that resulted in a fantastic park. As Tony Baxter himself said, every land has details 
upon details. Disneyland Paris is a great case study for theme park designers and architects. All of this because of the great creative leadership from people like Tony Baxter, Eddie Soto, Tim Delaney and Tom K. Morris. But it would not have been possible without the creative help from countless Imagineers and artisans from around Europe. In the midst of this though, came a failure. Despite the dreams of CEO Michael Eisner and the countless Disney executives, the opening of Euro Disney did not go as planned. The number of visitors was below expectation, partially because of a recession and the large capacity of hotels. And for the next years the resort would be submerged in financial problems resulting in the cancellation of many plans. This is a harsh but important truth. Even if we do our best, spend countless hours designing and building something, it doesn't mean that thing will go according to plan and become a success. We simply cannot predict the future, yet, just like a ship in the middle of a storm, we must keep sailing, doing our best to keep the ship afloat. Thunder may scare you, high tides, fears of course, but at the end of all of that we see a light. After days the sun finally emerges, we see land. Was it worth it? For a designer, everything is worth it, if his creative mind is big enough, of course. As for Disneyland Park, it seems as if the sun finally emerged. Attendance has reached the stuff of dreams and it seems as if Europeans have embraced Disneyland Paris. However, a challenge remains. Park Disneyland has almost the same number of rides as other Disney parks, Tokyo Disneyland and the Magic Kingdom. Yet it feels as if Disneyland Paris is missing something. That is because the last e-ticket was Space Mountain de la Terra la Luna in 1995. Yet the park lacks a major new ride for everyone to run to in the morning, I mean safely walk to. Now, what would be this new ride? Where will it be located? The challenge at hand awaits both present and future generations of Imagineers. Are you ready to embrace this challenge?